Well, with commodities in a route, the RAND reaching record lows of financial markets, deeply, deeply uncertain. What should you be doing as an investor? This is The Money Makers. I'm Bruce Whitfield. And tonight, I'm getting a global perspective from Barclays Wealth Director of Global Investment Strategy in London, Henk Potts. He is in our studio in Johannesburg this evening. Markets are in a bit of a mess. Commodity markets in particular, Hank Potts. I don't know if you read the competitors' research, uh, but the piece of uh, research out of Investing Securities in London basically is saying that South African mining companies, Glencore, called Glencore South African. We, Swiss we, we South African. Of, we own it. We own <laughs> Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Um, uh, an Anglo-American, that British mining company with roots in South Africa, are in deep trouble because of high debt levels raised when money was cheap. Yeah and when commodity prices went only upwards. And it's, for South Africa anyway, very much a global commodities story right now. It is. It? Well, the world is changing. You'll remember we've been cautious on commodity markets for some time. We've spoken about this changing growth profile that's been taking place in China. Think about China, the driving force behind the commodity super cycle over that decade where we saw prices doubling. China moving from being this manufacturing powerhouse, this arena for state investment, into a domestic consumption-led economy. Their demand and their, their influence over commodity markets changing quite substantially. That's filtering through to market expectations. A long time that. Think about all that money that went into supply in terms of commodities mm. in the boom times. All that investment. Well, it takes time for that to come online. That's coming online now as demand is starting to wane. Throwing a stronger US dollar is pretty tough in the mining industry at the moment. But you look at China and you're forecasting 6% growth for China. It is nowhere near a disaster scenario. It was growing from a low base at 10 and 12%. Yeah. It's now growing at a high base at 6%. I absolutely agree with you. And it's changing type of growth that's taking place. We're talking about a smooth transition through this process. And actually, as you say, growth at 6% next year, not too bad at all. I think you have to look beneath the headline numbers to understand what's happening in China. Industrial production growing at nearly 7% in the second quarter. Not bad. We're used to double-digit numbers, but again, change coming through. Retail sales numbers, 10.2%. Now, that's where there's some of the concern. Seems like a fantastic mm. number on the face of it, of course. Probably needs to be higher if they're to make meaningful progress as they go through that transition to become this domestic-led uh, consumption economy. Um, but perhaps as economists, we should step back a little bit and ask ourselves, is China's middle class really that big? Number two, what is their propensity to spend? Because yes, they're becoming mm. wealthier, but they're not really spending a lot of that money just yet. Very high savings ratio in China, partly due to the fact they don't have a social security safety net. So people need to save there. So a few assumptions that we've made around China, even through this transition, I think need to be looked at a little bit. So what's the next commodities uplift? Because as South Africa, we're still heavily dependent on commodities as exports. Yes. It's crucial for our balance of payments. It's crucial yeah. for our current account, crucial for the trade account. All of these things are terribly important. What's the next driver of Hard the Hard to see where it's coming from, isn't it? Hard to see where it's coming from. There is global growth around. Let's not be too doom and gloom about this one. Global economy me grows at around 3% during the course of this year. Maybe higher next year, 3.5%. India, I think, is exciting, mm -hmm. actually. Remember, India's economy, very few natural resources. They still need to import that. Remember, one of the strategies they've got in India is to ramp up domestic manufacturing, the creation of these 100 focused cities over the course of the next two decades. So I think that could be important in terms of driving commodities longer term. But we should also remember something that we've seen before. Commodity prices come down. What happens? No one wants to invest in supply anymore, right? So what we do know is the global economy is growing. Yeah. Populations are growing mm. around the world. They'll need commodities in the future. And that imbalance will start to turn around. But it's not going to be any time soon, I'm afraid. When is, what, what's soon in, in your terms? Is it a two-year view or a five-year Well, I think we're at least looking at two years before we see a stabilisation in prices. Then we start to see some recovery phase coming through after that. OK, so commodities are one thing. Currencies are another. US uh, economy recovering quite yeah. smartly. Unemployment. We're almost record lows, beginning to see some wage inflation coming through in the US yep. economy. Janet Yellen, a little cautious on raising Too interest cautious. rates. Too, Too cautious. cautious. Bring back Alan Greenspan. <laughs> I mean, what is going on? Did, he, the, did he ever raise interest where rates? Where is the communication, I ask you? I mean, we didn't used to understand what he was saying. We've got no idea what the Federal Reserve are thinking at the moment. This was supposed to be, remember, this new period of forward guidance, of transparency from the Federal Reserve. We've not been seeing it. I think it was a mistake by the Federal Reserve. One and done is what the Federal Reserve should have done. Raised interest rates, come out with a dovish statement, reduce the uncertainty and reminded us actually this is going to be a slow normalisation of policy. What we do know is Fed funds is going to finish a lot lower 
that was anticipated, maybe around 3.5%. But they should have pulled the trigger on this rate hiking cycle. But you don't think they'll do it in October, December, January, February, maybe March? I think you've got to wait. Because what is holding the Federal Reserve back? Two things. Low inflation in the United States. Look at the CPI data running at just two-tenths of 1%. So that's holding them back a little bit. Likely to stay lower for longer, not only because of lower oil prices, but the strength of the US dollar. Alongside that, they're waiting to see if there's any fallout from the turbulence that we've been seeing in terms of Chinese markets. And that'll take some time to resolve itself. We can't see that being resolved by year end. So I think they'll wait until next year. March looking the most likely. If you look at Fed Fund's future, the probability of a rate hike coming through in December, less than 50% today. Remember, it was around 65, 70% before that policy statement came through. Now, one of the great benefits that South Africa is receiving by default is a low oil price yes. in dollar terms, below $50 a barrel. If we didn't have oil at $50 a barrel, we'd be in serious trouble as Painful. a country because we import far too much of the stuff yeah. and we use a lot of it as well. Oil price, you're forecasting continued low oil prices. What's low? $50 maintained I think so, $55 during the course of this year, maybe $63 average price for next year. I think the oil price has been driven down by some short-term factors, but also some long-term structural changes as well. Short-term factors include perhaps slightly lower growth than was anticipated at the start of the year. Inventory levels in the United States are very high. You've got these nuclear discussions that have been taking place with Iran. Remember, that's another million mm. barrels of oil set to be dumped on the over supplied market. For context, the global economy uses around 90, 91 million barrels per day. OPEC, no real consensus around cutting production, even though those oil prices come down. We know why, though. They want to drive those US <laughs> shale producers out of business. They're quite happy to see some low oil prices. We'll wait to see if that strategy works. And that, again, low oil for how long? A lower oil for yeah, how long? Yeah, I think so. So it's $55 during the course of this year. Not not particular surprise, but still only maybe getting up to around $63 as we go through next year. What we also know is if you look at the production levels in OPEC's Fragile 4, that's Iran, Iraq, Nigeria and Libya has been picking up quite substantially. Talk about the shale production in the United States. That change in profile in terms of growth from China means that they need to import less. So I think actually that dynamic would suggest that oil prices will remain lower for longer. You talk about the Fragile 4 in terms of OPEC. We're part of the Fragile 5 globally True. because of our twin deficits and our currency massively vulnerable 14 to the dollar this Absolutely. week. Diabolical currency performance. Well, uh, yes uh, and no. Uh, if you're coming to, from England with a few pounds yes, if you're and you're coming heading down to Canon Cop for a glass <laughs> of wine, it's not a disaster. But I understand where you're coming from. Listen, when you look at the South African economy, you realise it's an economy that's been struggling. There's no doubt about yeah. that. Electricity, security, a major issue. Pressure coming through on the consumer. Look at the business confidence numbers that you see here. The trend continuing to fall. I think the lowest level in four years. You know businesses are very nervous here. The key example for that for me is how much cash they're hoarding on balance sheets. More cash on South African corporate balance sheets today than has ever been the case in history. So there needs to be a turnaround in confidence coming through. Government policy really needs to be helping to drive that. But we got great government uh, uncertainty in government policy. Um, there, there's a big protest march happening this week and it comes to corruption. Big business government never further apart, perhaps. I think so. When, when, when you look at that from an outsider's perspective, you realise there's real concerns from businesses around land ownership, mining rights. They're concerned about whether this is an economy that's going to generate the right skills within the workforce to meet those demands of businesses. What about the commitment to implement the national development plan? So really some big issues on the table for businesses and governments to work together to try to overcome. But against this backdrop, it remains very difficult. I was at a conference the other day where big business was saying, well, maybe big business should just do what big business does. That is work, create profits, create the jobs, pay the tax and let government do what it does. It feels like we've got a very much, a very separate strategies in place from a state and from it a business. It needs to be a partnership. We know that businesses can do an awful lot. They need to be efficient, but they need to have the correct framework in order to do that. The correct regulatory environment to work within, structures being put around that. They need to make sure that they've got the confidence to go out there. If you're a business, you want to be out there spending your money. You want to be investing your money. And that, of course, what drives the economy forward. Times of uncertainty, they don't do that. And that, of course, is a real drag. What creates certainty? 
Well, I think government policy longer term, infrastructure is really important here in South Africa to work on. Electricity security is a major concern coming through. They need to start to deal with that. I talk to people, they say, well, Hank, it's getting slightly better. The load shedding we is starting. We haven't had load shedding for six weeks or something. Yes. <laughs> yeah, something exciting. Like that. So people, it just tells you how, how, how vulnerable it is yeah. that they talk in days about how long we've not had it. So they, they tell me there's an element of that coming through. The Reserve Bank, I think, estimates that uh, the problems with electricity security takes what six tenths of one percentage point off yeah. growth which is a pretty big slice of growth here in South Africa when the economy is only growing at one and a half percent that's really got to be the focus a little bit I think in the short term yeah I mean South Africa's got its big problems uh, the world however is coming right our trade partners are, are recovering nicely the UK economy yeah. your home base um, is flying after a period of austerity the European Union is coming right still plenty of room yeah. there for for monetary stimulus and China also got room for monetary oh, stimulus well. Within a, within, a, within a US economy booming as well, the North is looking OK. That's the good news is we've been reliant on emerging markets in the years after the financial crisis. The developed world had to go through this. A very painful period of restructuring. We know governments have been reforming their finances and restructuring the economies. Perhaps starting to see the benefit of that, of course, helped with that safety net that's been put in place by central bankers. I think Europe is starting to stabilise. If you look at some of the inflation data, though, if you look at the European Central Bank talking about inflation of just one-tenth of one percent this year, 1.1 percent next year, 1.7 percent all the way out to 2017. That says to us more quantitative easing is required going beyond the headline date. China, I think, well, the, there is some concerns about the devaluation and volatility mm -hmm. that we've seen in domestic markets. The biggest conversation is the long-term growth problem profile coming through from them and whether policymakers can actually still command the economy. You think China is this ultimate <laughs> command yeah. economy, don't you? They pull a lever, they get the reaction in the economy. Unemployment falls, growth goes through the roof, export starts to generate. If we've seen through this crisis a little bit, they pull the levers, that reaction is a little bit muted now, isn't it? So perhaps a change taking place. Perhaps that's good, though. Listen, we've been asking China for years to go through financial liberalisation, to reform their economy, to become a more market-based economy. Perhaps they're starting to do that, and perhaps we're realising there is going to be a price to be paid for that. Hank Potts, we must leave it there. Took Phineas Fogg 80 days to get around the world, and <laughs> took Hank Potts just 12 minutes. Barclays Wealth Director of Global Investment Strategy in London. Hank Potts in our studio this evening. There'll be more Moneymakers tomorrow. Until then, have a very good evening. Bye-bye.